What's up everybody? My name is Dr. Garrett Rossi and I'm a board certified psychiatrist who makes mental health content here on YouTube. If you're new to this channel, I would love to make you a member of the community. It really helps me to know that this information is valuable to you. And if you're a returning viewer, thank you so much for all of the love and support. It really does mean a lot to me that this information is valuable to you. Today's video is a bit of a public service announcement. There is this ongoing fascination on social media with certain psychiatric diagnoses, and it begins with the rise of self-diagnosing, and it ends with a bunch of individuals believing that they have things like autism spectrum disorder, tick disorder, or dissociative identity disorder, also known as multiple personalities. Now, I've seen a rise of this in my own practice as well, and I want to talk about one specific disorder today because I think there's a lot of misconceptions and misunderstanding about it. And the one that I've been seeing a lot of patients coming in asking me about is autism spectrum disorder. And often these individuals are looking to explain away symptoms clearly caused by other psychiatric diagnoses with autism spectrum disorder. And I can think of examples in clinical practice that might help you to understand better. So I had an individual who presented with what they believed was autism spectrum disorder. They described it quite profoundly in the diagnostic interview and why they thought it was the correct diagnosis for them. And of course, I'm always suspicious when somebody comes to me and says, I believe I have this diagnosis and it's got to be the, it's got to be the one. It's got to be the thing to explain everything that's going on for me. So I'm already a little bit skeptical and I became even more skeptical when I observed this individual socializing with other people on, on the inpatient unit because clearly they were socializing in a way that was not the way somebody with autism spectrum disorder would typically be socializing and it was clear and evident to me based on those interactions that I was observing that this individual did not meet criteria for autism spectrum disorder and clearly the distress that they were in was not related to that particular diagnosis. Now, there is no better time than now to discuss autism spectrum disorder. Let's dispel some of these myths. Let's talk about the diagnostic criteria and let's clarify all those things that you might have been thinking about or you might have heard about on other social media outlets. Something that many of you might not have known is that autism spectrum disorder was actually introduced in the DSM-5. Prior to the DSM-5, there was a different category, and this category was called Pervasive Developmental Disorders, PDD, and it included things like Asperger's Disorder, Autistic Disorder, and Pervasive Developmental Disorder not otherwise specified. So these are disorders that people are very familiar with. I think in particular, Asperger's Disorder is often talked about in popular media, and many people believe that they have this disorder. Now you might ask, why did they change the category in DSM-5 to just Autism Spectrum Disorder? What was the purpose? This was thought to improve the ability to make the diagnosis of Autism Spectrum Disorder, while still maintaining the sensitivity of its criteria. So this improves our ability to make the diagnosis and make the necessary observations. And in fact, the research suggests that 91% of those individuals who met criteria for the previous category of pervasive developmental disorders would also meet criteria for the DSM-5 autism spectrum disorder. So majority, 91%, not bad would all meet criteria if they were compared to the new DSM-5 version. They also grandfathered in those individuals who had a previously well-established diagnosis of autistic disorder, pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, or Asperger's disorder. So let's talk a little bit about the epidemiology here, because these statistics are frightening. In 2021, the CDC reported that approximately one in 44 children in the United States are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. So one in 44, that is a significant number of children being diagnosed as having autism spectrum disorder. So maybe I'm actually wrong, maybe everyone does have autism, but at least in the child adolescent population, this is a very common diagnosis. 
Now, the prevalence has been rising over the years, right? And there's many different explanations for why. The most logical explanation, and the one that the research really supports, is that we have simply increased our awareness of autism spectrum disorder, and we've gotten way better at making the diagnosis. So we're recognizing individuals with autism spectrum disorder, and we're able to make the diagnosis more effectively and efficiently. So that's why we're seeing what looks like an in a significant increase in the prevalence. It's just that we're detecting it more often now and we're able to understand what's going on a little bit better. Autism spectrum disorder is four and a half times more common in males than females, so more common in males. The median age of autism spectrum disorder diagnosis in the United States is 50 months, five zero months, which is about four years of age. Autism spectrum disorder can be found in all racial and ethnic groups, although the prevalence does appear to be higher in Caucasian children. All right, guys, so let's talk about what would be required to make a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. Now, the DSM-5 shifted their focus from three domains in prior classifications to two specific domains of deficits seen in autism spectrum disorder. The two domains that we're talking about here are social communication impairment as well as restricted slash repetitive behavioral patterns. It's also important to point out that individuals must have had these symptoms present in early childhood and the DSM-5 also added these things that they call specifiers, and specifiers help to indicate the level of severity. So there's a level one requiring support, a level two requiring substantial support, and a level three requiring very substantial support. Now the DSM-5 criteria requires a couple of things in order to make the diagnosis. First, we have to have persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction. And this will be manifest manifested by all three of the following. So you have to have all three of these things, these deficits in social communication and social interaction. Number one, deficits in social and emotional exchange. So what we can see here is a failure of back and forth communication, reduced sharing of interests, emotions, and affect, or a failure to respond to social interaction at all. The second one is deficits in nonverbal communication behaviors and social interaction. So this is an individual who has difficulty understanding facial expressions. So some of the person might not be able to understand what the nonverbal communications are saying, such as facial expressions. So they have difficulty with that. They have difficulty understanding body language, as well as very poor eye contact, which is usually a hallmark of autism spectrum disorder. The third one is deficits in developing and maintaining relationships appropriate for the developmental level. So they have a difficulty in establishing and maintaining relationships. So they have difficulty adjusting their behavior based on the social context. They have difficulty engaging in imaginative play and of course difficulty making friends. Now these symptoms are not necessarily exclusive to autism spectrum disorder in the adult population and there are many different disorders, including social anxiety, OCD, personality disorders, that could also explain these type of symptoms. So it's very important that we establish that these deficits were present at an early age prior to making the diagnosis. All right, so let's talk about that second domain, restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interest, or activities. So at least two of the following must be present stereotyped or repetitive speech, motor movements, or use of objects. So this can include things like simple motor stereotypies, lining up of toys, or repetitive use of objects. Number two, insistence on sameness. So inflexible adherence to routine, ritualized patterns of verbal and nonverbal behavior, or excessive resistance to change. So these individuals will be very fixated on adhering to routines and, and patterns of behavior and resistant to any type of change in that routine. Number three, highly restricted or fixed interests that are abnormal in intensity and focus. And number four, hyper or hypo reactivity to sensory input or unusual interest in sensory aspects of the environment. These individuals may have a rigid greeting ritual they may struggle with small changes in normal activity. 
I had a case specifically where the family took a different route to school one day and the child became so upset and distressed that they actually jumped out of the moving car because of the change in routine. This is the level of insistence on sameness that we're talking about in these individuals. Let's talk about the impact that gender has on autism spectrum disorder. So the prevalence of autism spectrum disorder is lower in females. I said that it's 4.5 or four and a half times more common in males. However, in females, when they are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, they have a greater impairment in social communication, lower cognitive function, and more difficulty externalizing problems than males. So the point here is that if a female is diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, then the deficits are far more substantial than those seen in males. So what causes autism spectrum disorder? This might be one of the great debates. Autism spectrum disorder is a complex neurodevelopmental disorder that is both genetic and environmental in nature. So it has genetic and environmental factors. Now family and genetic studies have been carried out and what we find is that these genetic studies identified a couple of things. Number one, autism spectrum disorder is a highly heritable disorder. The heritability can range anywhere between 37% and as much as 90%, with only 15% of those cases being attributed to a known genetic mutation. So what we're really saying here is that while it's highly heritable, autism spectrum disorder is what we call polygenic meaning that there are multiple genes that contribute to the disease. And many of these inherited variants actually contribute in a small additive way to the risk of developing autism spectrum disorder. There have also been neuroimaging studies that have been carried out and autism spectrum disorder is often associated with atypical brain maturation. Now children with autism usually have an excessive number of synapses in the cerebral cortex. So they have too many connections in their brain. And this is usually an indication that there's a problem with the process of pruning. And the process of pruning is an essential process that occurs early in childhood development, where these ex excess or non-used synapses are removed, right? kind of making the brain patterns, making these patterns, the ones that they are using, the ones that are important, very uh, substantial, removing any of the clutter, right? So this pruning process is critical, and when it doesn't occur properly, cortical maturation cannot occur the way it's supposed to. Now, other findings also include things like abnormalities in neurotransmitter levels, as well as immune dysfunctions and neuroinflammation. One of the greatest areas of controversy that we see all the time in medicine is the impact of childhood vaccinations as a causative factor for autism spectrum disorder. I can tell you, having reviewed the evidence, that the current evidence does not support this theory at all, and autism spectrum disorder is not associated with childhood vaccinations. Very important point, often misunderstood. What I can say is there are some clear environmental factors that do have an impact on whether or not someone develops autism spectrum disorder. Those environmental factors include things like exposure to valproate or valproic acid used in seizure disorder as well as bipolar disorder, air pollution, exposure to excess air pollution, low birth weight, and increased maternal and paternal age are all associated with an increased risk of for the development of autism spectrum disorder. There are several psychiatric diagnoses that are common in autism spectrum disorder that occur comorbidly. The number one issue is intellectual disability, followed by ADHD and seizure disorder. So approximately one third of individuals with autism spectrum disorder also meet criteria for intellectual disability. ADHD can be seen in as many as 30% to 50% of individuals with autism spectrum disorder. And if an individual with ASD does develop seizure disorder, then the seizure disorders are often difficult to treat and sometimes refractory to treatment at all. So they don't respond to treatment at all. There is also increased risk of gastrointestinal disturbances, things such as constipation and restricted food intake. The next logical question might be, how do we assess somebody with suspected autism spectrum disorder? 
The assessment of ASD actually requires not only the evaluation of the individual suspected of having the disorder, but also obtaining collateral information from caregivers and teachers because these individuals are often identified in childhood and that's where and we're going to want to get that collateral information from the care primary caregiver as well as the teacher if they're in school. Autism spectrum disorder remains a clinical diagnosis. What I mean by that is that this diagnosis is not made by any specific blood test or neuroimaging study. It is made clinically. There are several screening and diagnostic assessments that help to support the diagnosis. Probably the most well-known of these is the ADOS, ADOS, and this stands for Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. There is another example as well. It's the ADIR, which is the Autism Diagnostic Interview Revise. So those can help to support your suspected diagnosis. Most commonly, a delay in spoken language is one of the first symptoms that presents in autism spectrum disorder, and this will often prompt screening for autism. The starting point for these individuals is to check hearing and vision to be sure that the individual is not suffering from a deficit in either of these sensory domains, because obviously if they are, they're going to possibly present as having symptoms of autism that are not related to autism at all, but rather to their inability of the child to hear properly or see properly. So the first starting point is a hearing and vision exam. Another thing that may present itself is if you notice dysmorphic facial features or other features in the individual, you may want to do some specific genetic testing for specific disorders prior to conducting a formal evaluation for autism spectrum disorder. So let's talk a little bit about the treatment for autism spectrum disorder. I wanna start by pointing out that there is no FDA approved medication. There's absolutely no FDA approved medication for the treatment of autism spectrum disorder. The primary intervention therefore is going to be behavioral interventions. And these interventions should be started as soon as possible. If you wait too long, they're less likely to have the impact. So if you start early, they have a much, much greater ability to impact the person's life moving forward. There is one specific type of behavioral treatment called applied behavioral analysis. And this is a type of therapy that focuses on developing specific behaviors, such as social skills, communication, reading, academics, and other things such as fine motor dexterity, hygiene, grooming, and domestic capabilities, as well as job competence. So this is sort of an all-encompassing behavioral intervention that helps this individual to perform better and function better as they grow up. This should be the core of treatment and has good evidence to support its use. If medication is used, it's often used off-label, and if it's not off-label, it's usually used to treat one of the comorbidities, such as ADHD, for example, or to treat or target specific symptoms that are impairing the person's function. Usually the most common ones that people get really upset about, families get really upset about, is profound irritability, aggression, and anger. Now there are only two FDA approved medications for autism spectrum disorder related symptoms. And those two medications are the dopamine blocking medications, risperidone or risperdal, and aripiprazole or Abilify, they are both approved to treat irritability in children with autism spectrum disorder. So to wrap this video, what I want to say is that autism spectrum disorder is a complex disorder with multiple genetic and environmental factors contributing to the disease. Since it's a neurodevelopmental disorder, it is often present at an early age and suspicion of autism spectrum disorder should be followed up by a proper diagnostic evaluation before you make the diagnosis yourself. You should be evaluated by a professional who understands the disorder at a very high level. I think it's also important for people to avoid self-diagnosing and to be careful what information they're consuming on social media because not all of it is good information. With that said, I'm going to go ahead and hold the video right there, guys. If you have questions or comments, please drop them below. I will try to get to them as fast as possible. And thank you again for watching the video. Please consider subscribing and liking the video. It really helps me out and helps the channel to continue to grow. So thank you so much. I will see you next time.